All right, class. So today we're going to conclude our discussion on electrolyte solutions, understanding the origin of those standard state chemical potentials in a case where we can describe with a simple model how solutes, in particular charged solutes, ions, are solvated by polar solvents, something like water. So to recap kind of where we've been, we've been thinking about first taking some solution of water, like here, and imagining what happens if we place a charged solute, like an anion, in it. So this polar solvent has a material property known as a dielectric constant, tells you how sensitive is the response of this solution to electric fields, how much polarization develops upon applying a external field to that system. And one of the consequences of that polarization is that the dipoles of those water molecules will orient themselves around this ion such that in effect, it's like they bring up some amount of counter charge to the surface of that ion. We, de we defined that phenomena of the polarization that's, that decreases, attenuates some of the electric field emanating from the ion with the term shielding. Again, it is in effect due to solvent polarization. So that is a cartoon of how a solvent accommodates an ion. We made this quantitative by working out what the corresponding change of the energy of that system is as you add an ion to the solution. So the solvent accommodates an ion with a total change of energy which you could almost read off of this cartoon the total change is that which you would have predicted by just knowing what the interaction of that ion is with a surrounding charge that acts to neutralize it or shield it, namely the Coulomb potential between that ion, which has some magnitude Q, and the corresponding surrounding charge would give you another factor of Q it would be favorable because those positive charges the solvent brings towards the negatively charged ion. The consequence of unlike charges being attractive, they are brought up towards that ion to a distance, R, the radius of that ion. The factor of two comes from the fact that while the ion and dipoles of the solvent are favorably interacting, the fact that those dipoles align parallel to one another is unfavorable from their perspective. 
the consequence of that is a sharing of that energy, which gives you a factor of two as the total change. And then we realize that it's not a complete factor of Q, the charge that that solvent brings up next to the ion, but depends on how polarizable that material is. So the effective charge brought up to the ion is Q times one minus one over epsilon, where that epsilon is our dielectric constant. So I find this really such a simple and such a satisfying result. It's just like what you'd expect by just knowing Coulomb's law, you have an ion interacting with some amount of charge surrounding it. Coulomb's law says that the energy, potential energy of such an interaction goes like Q squared over that distance. So the information about the ion is in its magnitude of its charge, Q here, and its size that sets how close that accommodating charge of the solvent, solvent can come, that's R. And the only property of the solvent, which is important, is just how polarizable it is, how much charge it actually brings to the party, and that's summarized in that constant epsilon. So that's how a single charge interacts with a solvent. We have also worked out or discussed how that shielding affects interactions between ions. The effective potential and field that an ion generates in a solution which is polarizable is reduced by a factor of epsilon due to this shielding, this accumulation of what looks like a counter charge. So the potential away from an ion at the origin is what Coulomb would have told us, Q over R, now depressed by a factor of epsilon, attenuated by a factor of epsilon, and the corresponding field is analogously Q over R squared, that's the inverse squared law, multiplied by a factor of one over epsilon, and it is a field, it is a vector, so it has a unit vector that tells you its direction. And immediately there are consequences now if I have two ions that are interacting in the solution. So before we build up all the way back to our result of screening, if we only have two ions in this solution, so we consider a pair, the fact that those effective interactions are depressed immediately has a consequence for those ion-ion interactions. So imagine we have a charge Q separated from another charge Q prime, by some distance r and some dielectric constant. Let's give those ions some colors. Due to that dielectric constant, the ion-ion interaction which we could read off from our potential up here, is similar, simul, similarly decremented, reduced by a factor of epsilon. And so, for example, if we wanted to know what the probability of finding that pair of ions separated by some distance r, to note that probability p of r, it is going to be proportional to 
the Boltzmann factor, the energy of that pair, which we have just written down as factors of the magnitude of those charges divided by epsilon r. That's the energetic contribution. That's going to bias that density to be non-uniform if those charges are equal and opposite that will increase the probability of finding them at small r so that's an energetic part of that probability now there's many different for a given r, a given displacement distance, given magnitude of distance between them, there are many different directions that that r vector could point. In fact, if we do the accounting, the number of directions that that r vector can point in three dimensions, scales like r squared. This r squared is just the multiplicity, the number of ways that that pair could be separated by a distance r. That is something that makes large r more favorable. So this is, this will tend to favor solutions to become uniform, to spread those ions out. So that very clearly is a multiplicity, so therefore it's an entropic effect. So just by thinking about two ions in this dielectric medium, we see the tug of war between entropy and energy. If those ions are oppositely charged, energetically will favor them to be close, entropically, we will favor them to be far, further away because there are many more ways for them to be far away. That kind of little simple calculation for just a pair of ions will help us intuit the behavior when we go back to our distribution of many ions. Let's remind ourselves of what we did last lecture. as we discussed the non-ideal effects associated with having many ions in solution. So the picture we were developing last lecture was to take our solvent, which was this dielectric medium, this solution that could be polarized, has some dielectric constant, and in which there are many ions. Imagine I tag an ion there at the origin. If it's a cation with well, a Coulomb potential will increase the likelihood that there are anions in its immediate vicinity. But those anions, of course, bring with them cations etc so if i was to look at some given distance around that tagged ion what i would see is a cloud of other ions which are enhanced with those counter ions that in effect neutralize the charge in that region outlined in the dashed 
circle. We worked out last time that that length scale over which I have to go to see an effectively neutral solution beyond which the potential due to that tagged ion decreases was something that we could compute. The characteristic length scale beyond which oops, the electrostatic potential from that tagged ion is zero. We defined as the length scale lambda. Just from our considerations of pairs of ions, we would expect that lambda increases with increasing temperature. Entropy will tend to favor ions being further apart from each other because there are more ways in which at the same at a constant energy they can be further apart from each other and hence the multiplicity grow, goes up we know that entropic effects become more important with increasing temperature because the relevant free energies are decreased by factors of s times t we expect that lambda increases with increasing epsilon, with increasing dielectric constant. Again, if we go back to this calculation of a single pair, we found that epsilon sits in the same place as temperature in the probability of finding two ions some distance apart. So as I increase epsilon, I increase the polarizability of those solvent molecules or of the solution. I allow for the tendency of ions to be further apart on average. They interact more weakly with increasing dielectric constant. Finally, we expect lambda to decrease with increasing concentration. Now think about that for a second. Why would that be true? Why would we expect the characteristic length scale beyond which the potential to be zero to decrease if we have more ions around? Well, that should be clear too, right? If I have more ions around, there's more chance that I can accumulate those ions in a smaller distance such that I neutralize or screen the potential from some tagged ion. The fact that I have more ions that are mobile, that can reorganize themselves in response to the potential of that tagged ion means that it is easier for me to screen that potential at shorter length scales. So these expectations can be seen to be borne out in the explicit calculation we did last lecture, which now will give a name to the calculation we did is the so-called Debye-Huckel theory. Debye shows up again. He's a founding father of solution chemistry. You know, he's that guy who challenged Einstein when they were thinking about lattices of, of harmonic oscillators or crystals and their heat capacities. Huckel, you probably encountered in your 120A class. You know, he was the 
He is responsible for Huckel's rules of aromaticity and as a student worked with Debye to sort through this calculation of how ions distribute themselves in solution. So let's recap what we found in that approach before. So again, we have our solution. We have some charge Q at the origin. It will generate some electric field at different points in space. Say that point in space R. Other ions which are attracted or repelled from that ion at the origin might be at position R prime. The presence of that additional ion, this cat ion here, then itself generates an electric field. So if I was going to query the potential at R, it has a contribution both from the ion tagged at the origin and this other cation. That field, the distance between this point in space R from the cation in green is R minus R prime. And I have many such ions that are going to be around that tagged charge at the origin, all of which will exhibit, will exert fields on some point R. Oh, the approach that Debye and Huckel took in formulating this question was to think about characterizing the density of ions on average at a point in space R, given they fixed a charge at the origin. From Boltzmann's statistics, we know that that density is going to be the density in the bulk solution of species J, either a cation or anion, times the probability that I find a particular ion at that point in space, which is just given by its Boltzmann factor. The energy of an ion at some point in space is the charge of that species times its potential, the potential of that species at R. And what they did was they assumed that they could replace that fluctuating potential by just its average, average condition on there being an ion at the origin. This was an approximation. And it had the form of this mean field theory like we've used a couple times already, where we take some complicated interaction energy that depends and correlates all species together and replace that fluctuating piece of that energy by just an average. Again, it's the same as you encounter in thinking about the electronic structure of the helium atom. There you have two electrons that interact with each other and both of which interact with the nucleus. That's a three body problem that one can't solve exactly. So you replace the interactions between the electrons as an average interaction between them, which then lets you solve those, that Hamiltonian approximately. So Debye and Huckel postulated that this was a good approximation for how ions distribute themselves and noted that from knowledge of that charge density at R, they could compute that mean electric potential. That potential had two pieces, which we've just sketched out in that drawing. There's a piece 
directly from Q at the origin. That piece there, that's the electrostatic potential that an ion at the origin exerts on a distant on a position R. And add to that the contributions of the potentials from all of the other ions that are located at all other points in the fluid. So to add up all of those contributions, you integrate over space and sum over ion types. The Coulomb potential of that ion, which is just its charge over that dielectric constant and the distance to the point R of the point we're averaging or summing over R prime. And then we need to know the probability that there was an ion of that type at that point, which is given to us by that average density. And now that average density is determined by the bulk density and that electrostatic potential. So we could substitute that equation, that form of the charge density in, and we're left with something which is nonlinear. That potential, even though it's just the average potential lives up in the exponential, making that equation difficult to solve. So if we assume that the density is low, we can expand that exponential to first order. making that equation linear and therefore sol solvable. So if we plug this expansion into this summation, we'll get a sum over the species, the charge weighted by its density. When we expand that to first order, that's a sum over the charge weighted by just its bulk density to start. That's something which is gonna be equal to zero due to charge neutrality. If I sum over, if I ask for the total charge density of both cations and anions, that has to be zero in a macroscopic system, sorry. And then the first order correction will go like beta, a sum over the charge species, rho of that charge, now Q squared times that average potential. Now note the average potential doesn't depend on the species. It is the potential that a test charge would feel, not a specific ion. So that whole sum can be defined as its own variable and we call that twice capital I for ionic strength. It's essentially the simplest measure of how many ions there are in the solution because if we just sum over the charge weighted ion densities we get zero due to charge neutrality. So putting all of this together, we have an equation for the electrostatic potential at R. Again, it has the direct piece minus twice beta that ionic strength over epsilon and an integral over space the potential at that point in space transferred to the position 
R that we're interested in. This spherical coordinate integral can be done in two of those coordinates simply, it gives us a factor of four pi. We'll have from that Jacobian and spherical coordinates, a factor of R squared. If we note that R squared over R, well, that's one factor of R. That volume element will leave us with one more factor of R. The left-hand side of that equation is the potential. We have a potential under the integral. So it must be that this factor here has units of length squared and inverse. So indeed, pops out even before trying to solve this equation, which looks indeed a little intimidating, we have picked out a length scale, an important characteristic length scale, that we will go ahead and denote lambda squared and inverse. We'll add in that factor of four pi, leaving us eight pi. We have a beta, the ionic strength, all over epsilon, or solving for lambda, we have epsilon over eight pi i, KBT up top to make that a little neater. And that's all under the square root. This is what's known as the Debye screening length. Indeed, if you actually were to solve this equation using Fourier transforms, it's a little ugly, but can be done. It's a linear equation, which is why it can be done. What you find is that the electrostatic potential due to that tagged charge is equal to Q over epsilon r, what you'd have in the absence of the other ions, but modulated by a factor of e to the minus r over lambda, which for r much, much greater than lambda, indeed finds that potential go to zero. So what we have just demonstrated is that indeed the surrounding ions screen that charge. They reorganize themselves such that in the vicinity of that tagged ion, I only have to go a distance lambda before I don't feel the potential due to that tagged ion at the origin. The counter ions, when added to the ion tagged at the origin, effectively give a region of the fluid which is neutral. So a very sensible question would be to ask, well, how big is lambda? We have an explicit formula for it. Formula here, factors of dielectric constant, ionic strength and temperature. So we need to specify, say, what sort of solution we're considering. So say a 0.1 molar NaCl solution in water, that will tell us what the dielectric constant is, and room temperature. Lambda works out to be about one 
nanometer, really microscopic distance, about three water molecules away, I don't feel the charge due to that single, say, sodium at the origin. Now, one could actually, from that electrostatic potential, compute the interaction energy of an ion with its surrounding ions. The interaction of an ion with its other ions is just determined by that electrostatic potential. And we have that electrostatic potential. The E interaction, we'll call it, is the interaction on average. And it, it is such a beautiful result. I love this result. It's one of my favorites in physical chemistry. Because again, it's exactly what you might expect or might guess. The interaction energy is Q squared for a charge Q at the origin, epsilon over lambda. That is to say that it is the energy, the Coulomb energy I would have guessed by knowing that there was a charge lambda away from the charge at the origin. Now in reality, there's not one charge a distance lambda away. Rather, we integrate over lots of different positions the Coulomb potential of many different charges, say of type J, weighted by their charge. So that's the full interaction energy, but when we actually plug in what that density of ions are, we find that the result has this simple physical form that it is that lambda being the characteristic length over which I see a neutral solution is the distance over which those effective interactions have acted. Now, just like before, the total electrostatic energy is different from the electros from just the interaction energy of the ions of the ion with its surrounding other ions. So if we ask for the total electrostatic energy, there will be the attractive negative inter energy from the tagged ion interacting with its counter ions, but by enriching those, that region with counter ions, the counter ions themselves interact again in an unfavorable way. If I put a cation at the origin, I will accum uh, accumulate some amount of anions in the vicinity of that cation. But those anions will wanna push each other away. And so the total electrostatic potential will be some compromise between the two. And again, we find that that whole results in just a factor of one half as favorable as we would have guessed from just knowing the interaction energy. So the delta E total is minus Q squared twice epsilon lambda. So now we discussed in the context of the Born solvation model how that interaction energy gave us a means of thinking about the standard state chemical potential of a single ion in solution. Here, we've gone beyond that dilute solution model. We've explicitly considered the interactions between other ions, how they 
are spatially correlated. So it's not obvious how we relate this calculation, this energy we've been able to, to compute to our dilute solution theory. And it turns out the way to do this is to introduce a new sort of effective concentration. That is to say, we could imagine writing down the chemical potential for a species J, a cation or anion, as what we would have had in the dilute solution, which would have its standard state chemical potential, a factor of KBT, log the mole fraction, that's our dilute solution theory. And if we account for interactions between ions, what we find is that we add in a term that's this total interaction energy. So we modify the chemical potential by an energetic contribution that comes from those ion-ion interactions. Now note, this is a non-ideal contribution to the chemical potential because lambda depends explicitly on the concentration. It does, the, does so, oh, that's hard to read. It does so through the ionic strength. That lambda depends on the ionic strength. The ionic strength is just the charge weighted concentration. So the concentration appears in this expression for the chemical potential both in the ideal solution piece, the non-standard state part of that dilute solution piece, as well as this additional energetic contribution. So that makes this form of the chemical potential a little more cumbersome. There's no way of simply differentiating or reorganizing it such that there's a simple factor of just concentration in one term and not concentration in the other term. So what people invented to recover some semblance of that structure is to pull in that energetic contribution by writing it like so. If I take the log and the exponential of that factor, I can pull it inside this log. That's an exact rewriting of the above equation. Again, the log of a product is the sum of logs. If I take the log, that must be, let's see here. Yeah, okay. So what people have done is to rewrite that by pulling in that effective interaction term, redefining a new standard state in the process, you have what looks like a concentration times that extra piece that depends on concentration through lambda, you could call that an effective concentration. And this is what is known in the literature as an activity. So 
So activity coefficients are corrections to dilute solution theories and account for, in the simple case, the interactions between ions. Okay, so that's really all I wanted to say. We can go ahead and end here for the day. Um, this really is the last lecture on mass transfer equilibrium, mass equilibrium consequences of the second law with regard to how mass partitions itself. We have two weeks left in the semester. And what we are gonna do in those last two weeks is really just shift gears. So we're gonna spend the last two weeks thinking explicitly of questions in dynamics. So not how molecules arrange themselves in space, but rather how they move around in space or how they move around between different chemical species, how, how one should use the framework of statistical mechanics to think about chemical reactions. What we'll see is that, again, there's some simplicity associated with thinking about even complex chemical reactions with the tools that we've built up over the semester. And what we'll show is that some of those basic rules that you have been taught about how, say, temperature affects the rate of reactivity can be simply rationalized within that framework. All right, so I guess one other note. So um, we have a midterm coming up. I will be posting to B courses the procedure for that upcoming midterm. We've got a couple weeks before uh, it's come up. So the midterm scheduled for April 28th. I will post um, a practice exam next week. Uh, probably Monday or Tuesday. Um, probably the format of this exam, the format will, of this exam will be, and I'll post this to B courses so it's recorded there, that it will be a take home exam. You're, you should feel free to use your notes. You should not, however, feel free to use your neighbors. So I will expect all of you to work this uh, exam yourself. Um, and because of this, I will not be posting a template like I did last time. Uh, rather, I will give you 24 hours to take the exam. So that should be sufficient time to read through potentially wordy problem statements like I like to write. All right, so again, I'll post all of those details to B courses so you can read over them again, um, but watch out for those announcements. All right, I hope you're all well and stay safe.